All right, are we going, Miss Layla? Good deal. All right, we'll start out this morning. You'll see where we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 16 in a little while. But first, I want to share with you uh, some seventh grade physics this morning just to, uh, to start things off. Actually, they probably teach this in kindergarten now. It was seventh grade physics when I was uh, in, in school. This is about kinetic versus potential energy. All right, kinetic energy is the energy possessed by an object when it is in motion, such as this Kleenex box when it's falling. That's, it possesses kinetic energy when it's moving. Potential energy, on the other hand, is the energy possessed by an object at rest. Now, the thing about potential energy is it is affected by several details. All right? uh, in the case of falling, for instance, um, the object is affected by gravity. How heavy is the object? How much distance will the object uh, potentially cover uh, if it falls to have time for gravity to work on it to affect its speed? Um, so we would say this water bottle has potential, a greater potential energy than this Kleenex box, right? Because not only is it heavier, but I'm holding it farther up in the air, so there's more potential energy in the water bottle but the thing is this. See, potential energy never becomes kinetic energy unless the object is put into motion. That's physical law. Potential energy doesn't become kinetic unless it moves. Unused potential, here's the point of all this, just stays potential. Now, let's... Store that away. It had nothing to do with the... No, I'm, I'm kidding. It does have to do with the uh, sermon this morning. But I want to get on some Bible here. For, for centuries, let me give you some background where I'm going to set up where I'm at here in, in Scriptures. For centuries, God had reigned as ruler over the nation Israel. All right? And God used judges to maintain order and uh, His prophets to speak words to His people. And that's the way it worked, and it worked well. And when the people obeyed God, things went well. When they fell into idolatry, they fell into trouble. You know, that cycle of the nation of Israel through the Old Testament. Uh, and they would eventually turn back to God, and God was always seen as the supreme ruler, ruler over Israel. But as time went on, the people began to desire a king like other nations had, a man who would rule over them. And protect them from their enemies. And by the way, that's a picture of what happened between mankind and God on a much larger scale. You see, God was doing a perfectly good job of being in charge. Everything was right and good in the world. And Adam and Eve had everything they would ever need. But they decided that they needed the same knowledge that God had. Essentially, they placed themselves in charge instead of God process plays out. So you're probably familiar with the story as we're going on. You know, God gives them a king, the nation of Israel, that is. His name was Saul, and he was a disaster. He gets to be king, as we're looking in the in scriptures, only for six chapters. All right, uh, It's debated as to how long he actually reigned uh, altogether, but it's only six chapters in the scriptures. And just a few years into his reign, as he's going, uh, it's only just a few years when God rejects him and chooses a new king. And we know that's going to be King David, who comes up after him. Uh, and it would be several adventurous years from that point until David took over as king. Let's read with me quickly uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 16. Hopefully you didn't do like I did, but went ahead and took the, uh, the head start and got there. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Let's look at the, uh, the account of the choosing of King David in 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> Scripture says, And the Lord said to Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him who I name unto thee. 
Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on his height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And again Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are, are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent... And brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and with all of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil, and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Did you notice there, as we read those scriptures, that it seems that no one in David's family saw David's potential to be the king. And it's not even clear if they knew what the anointing was for, actually. So it may be even that they didn't see David as worthy to even come to the ceremony with the prophet of God. It's not an unusual thing for the world to mistake potential. Let me tell you something about finding your potential. We're talking about uh, potential this morning. Uh, see if you agree that this is how it usually works. This is, this is the way it most of the time happens, but, but I want to tell you this is, this is backwards, okay? Usually it's the world, the environment that you are in that dictates to you, that declares to you your potential. And the way it works is this. It's based on your environment, the factors that are evident. Now, now this happens especially when you're young. All right? This is the way that we usually see this when you're young. Whatever your environment is becomes your default level of potential in the eyes of the world. Here's how it sounds. It might be positive potential. Uh, you, you've heard people say, if I, if I, like if a child grows up in a rich business family, it would be said, well, that child has great potential to be successful in business. Right? If your dad is Archie Manning, somebody might say, those boys have great potential to be professional quarterbacks. Okay? A kid uh, may be from uh, any background, uh, but have obvious talent, like music or sports. And then we would say in the world, well, that kid's got a lot of potential to do something with those talents. Uh, how about this one? She's very pretty. She has the potential to be very successful. You see how uh, it did, what that has to do with success, but that's the way the world sees it. But when the world is picking potential, it can be as much negative as positive. You see, uh, it might sound like this. I know the family that kid comes from, he doesn't have much potential. Because that's the way the world sees it. You know, that, that's sad, but I've done it. I've, I've been there. I've looked at kids growing up and uh, in, in knowing the family situation that they were coming from and thought, this kid doesn't have a chance. You know, he's going to be on drugs or in prison one day or both. Uh, you know, and, and that's, that's reality that the odds are stacked against some people. But that's a worldly view. You know, somebody who has no athletic ability, no brains, no good looks, that means no potential. And that's the way the world sees it. And because that's the prevailing thought, if we grow up in one of those categories, we automatically receive that declaration of potential. Now, I use growing up as an example because that's the way we see it most of the time. That's the way we all faced it when we were growing up. The world tried to declare to us what our potential would be in the world. But that doesn't stop at any certain age, does it? In fact, it probably never does. Now, I'll say a little more about that in a minute. All right, but there comes a point 
Number two here, where either, either you're growing up or you already have uh, and you decide, you have to decide if you will accept or if you will reject what the world has declared as your potential. You see, way too often, those who have been told they have no potential or not much potential just accept that as a fact. And, and then the pattern of their life takes place around that low expectation. Right? But sometimes, sometimes they buck the system, don't they? See, sometimes that kid from a poor family becomes a millionaire. It works in society. We've seen that. All right? Sometimes that kid that was voted most likely to succeed fails as a grown-up. Which brings me back to the point that I made just a minute ago. You don't have to be a kid to face this. What about the person who had everything growing up for them and then blew it? And they ended up with addictions or broken households or all manner of unexpected problems. And the world looks at that person and says, well, he had a lot of potential, but it's all gone now. That's the world's view. All right, so you have to reach a point where you're going to either accept or you're going to reject what the world says is your potential. Then after all of that, remember we're looking at this the backwards way here, although it is the usual way, but after all of that, if God enters the conversation at all, then you dictate to him what you believe your potential to be. Have you ever noticed that? Do you get to dictate things to God? No, but we do it anyway. It's like, it's like saying, God, don't expect anything great from me. I'm not a person of very high potential. You know, it's one of those things that we don't, we wouldn't really say that, but our actions or our lack of actions will say that for us. Now in that model, who established your level of potential? The world did. They did. Here's how it should work. Your potential, number one, your potential is based on what God decides to do with you. Nothing else. Your potential in the eyes of God is not dependent on your position in society. It's not dependent on your environment or your intelligence or your physique or your appearance. It's not even dependent on your ability. Because what God declares as your potential, He will provide you with the ability to achieve it. What is your potential in Christ? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. There is no limit to what God can do with you. Now, number two, and the only thing similar between these two is that you have to decide whether you're going to believe or reject what God declares about your potential. Did you know that you have potential in Christ even if you do not yet know Christ as your personal Savior? Because you have the opportunity, you have the potential. Now sadly, the sad thing is, many people will pass on the opportunity to even receive Christ as their Savior because they do not believe they have the potential to live up to the standards of being a Christian. That is a misunderstanding of what we talked about last week, and that is grace. You do not have the ability to live up to the standard, but you have the potential because your potential is in the hands of an almighty God, not a broken human being. You know, some have enough faith to believe in God for salvation, but not enough, it seems, to believe that they can do much for the kingdom it's like this, oh yeah, I got saved, but I can't do much. I got no potential. So I'm just going to come to church sometimes when I feel like it. Not because I'm sick, but because I can't contribute very much. And that's a misunderstanding as well, isn't it? That's a misunderstanding of the power that you work in. Because it's not your power, it's His power. You have a calling and you have gifts 
And you have an ability to do what God has called you to do. Did you notice how this is opposite of the first way that I was describing to you? Alright, so the world around you, the ones that in the first example that, that we looked at that usually set your a declaration of potential, the world around you, uh, they, their only part in this, if we're doing it right, is to comment on what they see. And we have to give them that because they're going to do it anyway. And they might say, they might say something like this. They might say, wow, I can't believe he was able to do that. Or maybe if they recognize God, they might say, wow, I didn't know God could use him in that way. Either way, what they're saying is, I didn't think he had the potential. Or they might say this. They might say something like this. I'm so proud of her. She's living up to her potential. Or they might say, you know what, he's completely faking it. I know where he came from, and you watch, give him time, and he'll go back to what he's always been. The world always has a comment, doesn't it? You know which one of those opinions counts? None of them. None of them. I would hope for the second one. But the only one whose opinion of your potential and how you're living up to it matters is the one who established your potential in the first place. And that is the Lord. And he says this, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. That verse goes on. He says he has plans to prosper us and all sorts of good things that he plans to do for us that, that is the, the declaration of our potential comes from God. Now, let me talk about David for just a few minutes and then I'll, before I get done. All right. First of all, let's look at this. What was their perceived level of potential? If you're still in 1 Samuel, I hope you were. Flip back with me to chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And here's where Saul comes on the scene. 1 Samuel chapter 9, 1 2 says, Now, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphiath, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man, goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders upward, he was higher than any of the people. Wow. Look at the qualifications of Saul, the potential. His dad was a man of power. That means he was wealthy. He was from the, he was the, family, he was from the family of a man who got things done. Saul would probably grow up and follow in his dad's footsteps. He was choice and goodly, Scripture says. Read that as he was popular and handsome. He was a popular, he was a good-looking guy. He had the looks. And it says he was taller than anybody else. It made him look big and strong. Doesn't he just sound like king material? But then we, we read about David a few minutes ago. There was nothing special said about his dad. You know, he, he owned sheep. He had some sons. We know looking back that he was special because he was in the lineage of the Messiah to come. But at the time, he was just a man of Bethlehem. It does say that David was good looking. There's nothing mentioned that makes him sound imposing in any way to the world. It would have appeared that Saul would be a much more successful king than David all right, but let's throw that away for a second and think about this. Where did their actual potential come from? Now, if you didn't know the story well, and you might think, you know, you, you know a little bit, you know that like we said earlier Saul was a failure, David was a success, and you might think that I'm going to say that, that David had potential from God, but Saul did not, and so he failed. But look at this. Here in 1 Samuel chapter 9, look at verse 15 through 17. So now Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came saying tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin and that he be captain over my people that he may save my people out of the hands of the Philippines for I have looked upon my people because their cry is come unto me 
Uh, and, and verse 17 says, And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spoke to of thee, this same shall reign over my people. And then go down to chapter 10 and verse 1. We see Samuel here says, Then Samuel took a vial, a vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And then go down a little farther to chapter 10, verse 6 and 7. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. This is Samuel talking to Saul here. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are come to thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Did you see all that? God chose Saul. God anointed Saul in the same manner as he later did with David. And God empowered Saul by his spirit to do his job as a king. Saul had just as much potential to be a good, godly king as David did. Look at the anointing that, that, that God put on David, a little while later, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, in the, in, anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Same thing as what happened to Saul. They had the same potential. One looked like he had the potential and was granted the potential. The other like he had nothing to, to do with the potential. And he got the same potential. And one lived up to that potential, and one did not. Because you see, potential never becomes kinetic if you don't use it. Look at the charge that Samuel gave, the prophet gave to the, to the people and to King Saul at his inauguration. This is uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. First Samuel 12, 13 and 14. Samuel's got everybody gathered up and he tells them this. The, the king, the new king is there, the people are there. He says, now therefore behold the king whom you have, we, ye have chosen and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. Then just two years into his reign as king, you can read this in chapter 13, uh, Saul is about to have to go into battle. And he's nervous, he got nervous, he got arrogant, maybe he got both. And he, uh, he, he's supposed to wait for Samuel to come and make a sacrifice before they go into battle. But because he got nervous or arrogant or whatever he got, he made the sacrifice himself. Now the thing was, uh, he, he not only did he disobey Samuel, and who was the voice of God, in not waiting, um, uh, he was not qualified to make this sacrifice. It was not his job. And he knew it wasn't. And for his disobedience, and more to come afterwards, because there was a pattern of disobedience with Saul, God told him this in chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And we know that man after God's own heart would be King David. Who while he was not perfect, he sought God. And he followed God. And he glorified God as he led his people. And is known to this day as the greatest king that Israel ever had. That's a title that he will hold until King Jesus sits on the throne of King David. Now quickly, let, let's apply this to us. And I'll go ahead and have our musicians start making their way to the front. 
I'd like you to consider something right now. What is your perceived level of potential? Some may think, I'm too young and inexperienced to have much, or, or I'm too old and frail to be of much use to God. Some may think, my past is too rough for me to be much use for God. And some may even think, you know, the things that are going on in my life right now are just too bad for me to be of use to God. And I can't imagine anybody sitting here today thinking this, but some in the world might even think, you know what, I have enough potential of my own, I don't even need God. I want you to think about that this morning. Assess your, your perceived potential for this. I want, you to, I want you to capture that thought and throw it out. Because your potential is dictated by God. And if you are still breathing, He has a plan to use you. No matter your age, no matter your health, no matter your past, not even your sin, because God has an answer for that. Not even if you're hearing this message knowing that you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. My God is mighty to save. Why not let's fix that right here and now. When we sing, if you need to receive Christ, come up here and see me. If you want to pray, come on, the altar will be open. If you want me to pray with you about something, come on up. Let's stand together. What shall we sing?